All right, so we continue with portfolio theory. This is lecture three on portfolio theory. Oh, 6-2 is a delegation. No, that's not what I have in mind. I wanted to continue with 5-5, uh, five, uh, five, okay? So, uh, the construction, first of all, is risky. Portfolio. You're told the risky portfolio, it consists of stocks, but of course you should be aware that your risky portfolio should also have other elements. Uh, commodities are always a good choice to have some, so commodities. And of course you, your risky portfolio should include real estate, uh, for the simple reason that real estate is uh, risky investment, not as it has been believed over the last decade by 200 or 300 million Americans that real estate is risk free. So, once you construct the risky portfolio, and again, you may just have one asset of, the, of your portfolio. The risky portfolio could be of two assets, or the risky portfolio could be of 500 or 5,000 assets. Whatever your risky portfolio is, your next step is to construct the complete portfolio. Complete. Complete portfolio. So the complete portfolio simply has two components. The first component to the complete portfolio is the risky portfolio. And the second one is the risk-free component. Risk-free component. The risk-free component is usually in the textbook recommended to be bonds. First of all, treasuries. Uh, Wall Street would rather prefer to sell you money market mutual funds, money market mutual funds, and you know, the recommendation you will never get because uh, you're always told that gold is an extremely risky investment, but then again, sometimes gold is very risky investment, sometimes gold is very safe investment. In extremely inflationary environments, treasuries are certainly not safe, and money market mutual funds are certainly not safe. So when you get to look around in highly inflationary environment, there is not much left which is safe, except for possibly gold. So as inflation begins to accelerate in the economy, Gold should ideally be becoming a significant, or getting a higher percentage of the overall portfolio. So, so what does this become? Uh, component, component, component as in element. One gold can be risky. Hmm? What can gold be risky? Uh, gold is usually considered to be risky uh, in this inflationary environment. After you have had a significant period of inflation, and inflation had been accelerating during that period, and market participants have begun to factor in even higher future inflation, usually gold price accelerates ahead of inflation in expectation of further inflation. In other words, the price of gold discounts future inflation. It discounts the depreciation of the currency. If for any reason, usually strong political will, uh, the government and central bank decides that it will not pursue its inflationary policy any longer, then they may begin to reduce inflation. In other words, to decelerate inflation. We call this disinflation. If you remember, disinflation was 
One year it's 10%, the next year is 8%, the next year is 6%. So, as inflation begins to decelerate, the price of gold may actually fall. That's because now market participants are expecting and discounting in future periods less and less and less inflation. So, this is what can make gold a fairly volatile. But, remember, it is not that gold is a volatile asset, and it is not that the value of gold uh, fluctuates a lot. It is that what you measure in paper dollars or any paper currency, its value fluctuates a lot. But you say, well, the paper currency is relatively stable, but the idea is that the value of gold incorporates expectations of future value of the paper currency. And therefore, as people expect the currency to devalue, they will actually discount it ahead. And this will be reflected in the price of gold. But again, the price of gold does not reflect volatility or riskiness of gold as an asset, but reflects the volatility and riskiness of paper assets, of paper money, because you know they are subject to a lot more risk. The risk of printing it, the risk of supplying more of it at almost free cost and thereby devaluing it. Alright, is that fairly clear? Alright, so uh, what we have here is, uh, let's see, the. Uh, okay, so the expected return, the expected return of a portfolio is fairly straightforward. You take the probability of the first asset multiplied by the expected return of asset one plus prob uh, not the probability, my mistake, guys, the share, the share in the portfolio. The share in the portfolio of the first asset times the weight, correct, weight. So P1, let's say P1 is weight, correct. Time the expected value of the first asset plus P2 uh, times the expected value of the second asset plus dot 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 plus PK, uh, the expected value of AK, where uh, the sum of P from I equal to 1 to K must equal 1. In other words, for the whole portfolio, the weights must add up to one. That's fairly uh, straightforward. Now, I want to get to what we were supposed to do or finish last time. This is the so-called capital allocation line. Within the capital allocation line, what you have is your risky portfolio. The risky portfolio is considered as one. Is a question? So, there is a risky portfolio. The risky portfolio we consider as one single portfolio. The portfolio itself has a particular, sometimes we designate the risk by sigma, sometimes we just write in plain English uh, sigma. Over here we sometimes say R, but sometimes we'll just say expected return of the whole portfolio expected return. So what you have is your risk portfolio has certain risk return profile. Let's add this concept. Risk return profile. The, the, the profile simply means is how do you characterize the asset by its risk and by its return. In other words, every single investment asset, no matter how risky or how, how relatively risk-free, again, remember, risk-free is only a relative concept. There is no perfectly risk-free asset. Every single asset will have some risk and some, of course, expected return. So this one, we characterize it over here on the risk return plane and we will have some RF and RF will be 
the risk-free rate and we can make a combination or any combination that we choose. Remember, this is from last time. You choose 100% risk-free and zero of the risky, you're at this point. You choose 50-50, then you're at this point. You choose 100% risky and no risk-free, you're at this point. You may choose 25% risk-free, 75% risky. So, as you get to run the weights, you're actually developing a line. And of course, the line is a straight line because it simply represents a linear relationship. So, this line gives you the ability to allocate your capital and it is simply called capital allocation line. So this is designated as CAL, CAL and stands for capital allocation line. Alright, so that's maybe straightforward. And then there's one last thing to consider. I'm not going to develop it now. But instead of having a risky portfolio, you may actually get a different portfolio, which is the market portfolio. So suppose this is the complete market. The complete market. If you simply choose between a risk-free asset and the complete market, where the complete market is presumably the collection of all risky assets. Sometimes they choose all risky stocks, all stocks in general. Others choose all risky assets, including, including uh, real estate, including commodities and everything else. You will get an alternative an alternative line, and I just want to emphasize, I draw it differently. It could be above, it could be below, it doesn't have to be necessarily have for the same risk higher return, this is not necessary. So, this is called uh, capital, capital market line. And either of these two simply gives you the attainable points of risk and return as you choose your weighting between your risk-free asset and your risky asset and of course these two weightings always add up to one. Alright, now there is yet another possibility, there is yet another possibility, let me wipe this off and that possibility is that even though you have your risky portfolio over here, there's a possibility that you can actually move further out. You can actually move further out. Well, how can you possibly move further out? Well, if we're over here, we can possibly have, remember, the weighting of the risky asset here is zero. Here's a quarter. Here's a half. Three quarters. This is one. So the risk asset, the weight could be 1.1. Well, if the weight is 1.1, then the other way to happen for the other is to be minus 0.1. The two weights must add up to one. There is no problem for the weight of one of them to be above one, and for the, the weight of the other one to be less than one. There is no problem with that. When this occurs, then the asset which has a negative weight, we simply call shorts or shorting. You guys familiar with shorting? You need an explanation of what shorting is? No. <coughs> what do we mean no? Not familiar? Alright, so shorting is simply borrowing an asset without actually purchasing it now. It is you borrow an asset, typical example will be a stock, you borrow it from someone who has it. In the real world you will borrow it from your broker, but the broker himself will borrow it from one of his 
other clients. So a broker may have 10,000 clients. Someone else will have purchased that asset in their portfolio. So the broker will borrow it from one of his other clients. If, none, if nobody in the brokerage owns it, the broker will contact a central database of all other brokers and we'll see who has this particular stock of IBM, Microsoft, or whatever available for borrowing. So, the broker will eventually borrow it from somebody, possibly a client or another broker. Now, you get the shares and you actually sell them on the market. And when you sell it on the market, you actually sold something that we don't own. Next step is two months later or two years later, whenever you decide to cover the short. So, to short means to sell an asset which you don't own. And then the opposite, the opposite transaction is called, is said to cover a short. And covering a short means to purchase an asset on the market which you previously sold short for the purpose of returning it back to the person that you borrowed it from. In other words, when you cover a short, you execute a purchase. So, to short means effectively has the meaning of sell. So, you sell a borrowed share. To cover a short means actually to buy, and when you buy and you get the share, you return it to whomever you borrowed it uh, from. Alright, so you can effectively execute a short over here, and when you execute a short, you sell, for example, government bonds. When you sell government bonds, what effectively happens is you get the proceeds, you get the money. So, uh, to short means to sell, you sell the asset, you borrow the asset, you sell it, you take the proceeds and you use the proceeds to buy the market or the risky portfolio. So you buy even more of uh, the risky portfolio. In other words, for example, if you have $100,000, this is your investable capital, capital which you have available to invest in. What you can do is you can sell for 10,000 shorts and you can actually, so this will represent a minus, and you can actually uh, buy in, uh, it's going to be 11, short hundred. Hmm? Short seven. Yeah, so short selling will be 10,000 short selling in our particular case will be bonds or whatever the risk-free asset is. So you take the 10,000 and you buy with your original 100,000 and the 10,000 for 110, you buy the risky portfolio. The risky portfolio. So you still, your portfolio is still worth 100,000 originally. You still have 110,000 of the risky portfolio, but you still owe 10,000 on those shares that you sold short and you use the proceeds. You still owe that money. So, this transaction will actually move you in the other direction. Of course, it could be perfectly possible, and many players do just that, they can actually do the opposite. They can move along here. In this case, they will be shorting the market, and when they short the market, they would be actually uh, buying bonds. There's nothing wrong with that. So what they do is they bet the market will effectively go down. They'll make money on that market. Two of you guys need a penalty? You got the penalty, okay? So uh, they sell the short the market, they bet the market falls, and at the same time, not only they make money on the short sale of the market, but they use the money, the proceeds from the short sale, invested it in government bonds, and they got the extra risk-free return. In other words, hoping to 
uh, gain if possible twice. All right. Of course, there is a risk in this transaction, right? And the risk is that you sold the market short, but the market did not go your way, which is down, but went against you. And of course, there is a possibility for you to lose some money or possibly a lot of money. All right, let's see what is uh, uh, next. Uh, next is uh, section six, five, six. So five six is about strategies. So let's try right out five six, and this is uh, passive.
hundreds, couple of hundred of ETFs, probably they're going close to a thousand. You want an Asian market, you get yourself an ETF. You want the Australasian market, you get yourself an ETF. You want the New Zealand market, or the Saudi market, or the Dubai market, or even the Bulgarian market. For each of those, you get an ETF, Eastern European market. So usually, what those investment banks uh, will do, they will figure out what might be a good ETF. In other words, what is a portfolio that uh, investors might want to have? One of the most popular portfolios was the so-called brick portfolio. What is brick? Brick. Hmm? Like those that you use in houses? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately not. B stands for Brazil. I hope you've heard it. R stands for Romania. Russia. <laughs> Romania means nothing in the global economy. Just like Bulgaria means nothing in the global economy. So we're moving to I. What's I? India. India, of course. And what is C? China. China. All right. So we call these. Emerging one. Emerging markets or emerging economies. So these are emerging economies, and the stock markets of these emerging economies we call emerging markets. All right. So some investors, at least for the last five, six, seven years during the boom times, uh, pre credit crunch, all believe that. BRIC countries, their stock markets will dramatically outperform uh, how we call the other markets. Developed markets. Developed markets, those of Western Europe and potentially the US. So they all loaded up on emerging market stocks. And the lesson learned was yes, they went up a lot faster and made a lot more money on the way up. And now these investors are learning that they are losing a lot more money a lot faster on the way down. How do we call this particular property? Risky. Risky. So they are, we say, riskier than the developed markets, right? Well, we just call this property volatility. It, we just say that developing markets are more volatile than developed markets. It simply means when going up, they go up faster, and when going down, they go down faster. Now, fast is not the best way to say. We should better say that they go up a lot more on the way up, but when they fall, they fall more on the way down. Percentage-wise, percentage. So this is what volatility means. Now, as I'm moving on, hopefully today, another way to express this is that beta of emerging markets is significantly larger of than beta of developed. All right, but. The beta developed markets we simply define as one. Yeah, one. That's the bonus point. It is one. We just define it as one. Usually we use these for US markets. Sometimes even for SP, again, it's very tricky exactly what we mean. Do we mean the complete stock market? Do we mean a particular index? But we do know that Dow Jones is relatively less volatile, so it has uh, a beta a little bit less than one. And we know that NASDAQ has technology stocks which are more volatile and has a beta of a little bit more than one. When you get to average them all up, you'll get one because one is defined as the whole market. At least in the United States, we like to usually choose for the whole market, the whole market of stocks. Okay? All right, let's move on and see what else we have. All right, so passive strategy is based on the strategy that securities are fairly 
Christ. Fairly priced. In other words, you expect the markets to be efficient. Again, some of this stuff is coming in the next chapter, or the chapter after that. If the market is efficient, it implies that you cannot profitably trade. Efficient market also means, I'm giving you, there are at least a dozen of different interpretations of what efficient is. But efficient simply means that you cannot simply pick stocks that will outperform the market. The idea is that if you can pick the stocks that, the, uh, the, that will outperform the market, so will be another fund manager and another fund manager. And if people expect a stock to outperform the market, they will all buy up the stock, they'll all drive its price up. And as they drive quickly its price up, then because of the higher price, it will actually provide more or less the expected return. In other words, it, you can't just get an above average return. You expect the house to be worth 100, but let's say 100,000. Right now it's 50,000. So you expect it in five years to give you roughly, let's say 100% cumulative return. Well, if everybody figures this out, soon they will buy the house or neighboring houses. They'll drive up the price to 80,000 and now from 80,000 to 100,000 you will get barely a 25% cumulative return, right? From 80 to 100 that's 25%, right? So suddenly you would be getting a more normal return of 10%. It's quite the same with stocks. So as long as you think there is undervalued, well maybe others will think the same and the idea is they'll drive up the price of the stock up and this will mean that it will lower the return to more normal. Normal means uh, expected or according to this line in line with its return, all right? So if it's efficient, then you can simply not cherry pick stocks. In other words, stock picking doesn't work and you might as well use a passive strategy. In other words, say, hey, the market is efficient anyway, it's not worth trying to pick stocks because stock picking is a costly process. Might as well just, you know, buy some well-diversified portfolio or some well-diversified index and just track the index. Sometimes this is called index, instead of indexing, it's called index tracking. Index tracking simply means that the particular asset or the particular portfolio correlates very highly with the index. Correlates highly in the real world industry means well above 99%, maybe 99.5% maybe 99.9% .9%. of course if you're trying to mimic or mimic is the same as track the S&P and the S&P has 500 stocks well, a lot of funds will just choose anywhere between 100 and 150 stocks and they'll choose only those stocks 150 stocks that most highly correlate with the whole S&P the idea is that if you choose all 500 you will run up a lot more commissions in maintaining that portfolio over time. All right, so let's see what else we have. So the idea of indexing and passive strategy is that you will choose some highly diversified portfolio, most likely something resembling the whole market, and then choose what percentage of, of your portfolio to invest in the market and what percentage of your portfolio to invest in the risk-free asset. In other words, based on your risk aversion, you will choose how far out you want to be. Of course, risk aversion is not the only determinant. Other things what might include, like what? Your wealth, your wealth, if you're a rich Saudi, you can afford to be far out there and speculate with a bigger chunk of your money, right? On the other hand, if you're a poor student who barely has 2,000 
dollars and you want to keep them for next semester's tuition, you want to be very much on the left. So sometimes wealth is also indicative. More wealth sometimes makes people more risk tolerant. The opposite of risk averse. Let's try to write this out. Risk averse. The opposite of risk averse is called risk tolerant. Of course, sometimes very rich people are also very risk averse. They say, I've worked all of my life real hard, I don't want to lose any of my money, alright? So, that's the second uh, element. The third element, which is very important for risk aversion, is the time frame, the time frame of investment. If you're 65 years old, just about to retire, you are relatively risk averse. The reason is common sense. If you lose a big chunk of the money, you do not have the ability to work and make up for those losses. You can't afford to lose a lot of money. All right, because you're going to be starving during. Your... Now, if you're 25 years old and you got roughly 40 years up to your retirement, you might as well speculate, and if you lose, you still have 39 or 35 or 30 years to catch up. So, time frame, we call this investment horizon. That's the next concept. <coughs> investment horizon. So, what I'm doing, guys, is introducing a number of important concepts which you should be familiar with. Maybe you already studied them, maybe not, but these are important invest concepts and investments we should have. So investment horizon is the expected period of holding that particular asset or that particular portfolio before you reasonably expect to need the proceeds, in other words, to liquidate the asset and use cash. So what you have, if you have a very long-term uh, horizon, then you can hold riskier assets, okay? Because in the longer run, the riskier assets will expectedly outperform. Now, if you have a very short-term uh, horizon, it may turn out that within two months or six months, actually you will get significant underperformance and you will have to sell and lose. In other words, the longer the horizon, the higher the overall risk tolerance. In the shorter the horizon, less risk tolerance. In other words, if you're now, let's say, November and you gotta pay your tuition in January, in two months, there is no way you can forecast the short-term performance of any market in the very short run for two months. So, within two months investment horizon, it makes no common sense to actually try to invest these proceeds for two months in a very risky manner, and then expecting to withdraw the proceeds and pay your tuition at college. That will not make sense. Now, there's no knowledgeable person will do that. What will make sense is you buy a money market instrument, maybe a CD or other safe instrument. Could be just plain deposit at a commercial bank, time deposit at a commercial bank, and in two months when it matures, you take the cash and you uh, transfer it to the university. Alright, questions? So, so, uh Investment horizon is basically when I plan to sell. Mm -hmm. Yes, investment horizon is the expected time to sell. Again, sometimes you don't know. The idea is that something may happen, you may have a significant major emergency. Sometimes, for a very young couple, they may have a very long horizon. That's perfectly normal. 25 year old, just married, they have an extremely long horizon. Well, the bride
wife gets pregnant and they say, honey, we need to buy a house. Uh, so, now the horizon, the investment horizon is being shortened rather than accumulate 100,000 for whatever, suddenly they will probably uh, take the money out maybe within three months, six months or two years to make a down payment to purchase the house, all right? So the point that I'm making is that the investment horizon is not a sure thing. The investment horizon is an expected value. You, you count on the property. For example, you have a good job, you're making good money, and everything's great, but you may get fired or laid off or whatever the reason might be. So suddenly your investment horizon may be shortened because you may have to actually withdraw out of that investment, all right? That's a possibility. Of course, if investment advisors will tell you or advise you that you should have three months, six months, or nine months of cash. We call these emergency savings, so that in case of emergency, medical or car repair, some other problem, you actually have the cash, so that you do not have to liquidate Risky assets when they have been at that particular moment underperforming because there are laws in nature we call them Murphy's laws, right? According to Murphy's law, what happens? You will have to sell exactly when the market is down, right? This is how it works in real life. In other words, more often than not, you will not have the luck to sell when the assets are high or outperforming uh, the market. All right, so, with this, uh, uh, okay, okay, one more piece, one more piece. So, what I did so far was did passive. Now, let's do the active. Active investing pretty much says, efficient markets, nonsense. Markets are not efficient. Well, we just saw that over the last, you know, three, six, nine months with the credit crisis and markets collapsing in 20-30%, we just saw markets are far from efficient. So, everyone thinks that they're smarter than the market because everyone thinks he knows more than everybody else. So they say, I would rather use an active strategy. Well, the active strategy effectively equates to the strategy of stock picking. In other words, active strategy is a strategy where you attempt to pick only those stocks that you expect to outperform and when you pick sufficiently many stocks, sufficiently many stocks to diversify the risk within those stocks that you pick, so you pick maybe 20, 30, 40, Usually those that try and stop picking, they usually pick anywhere between 20 and 50 stocks. Some people are even more confident in their skills. They pick only 10 stocks, 8 to 10 stocks. And the idea is that once these stocks you get a significant portfolio, 8, 10, 15, 20, and it's fairly well diversified, that portfolio will reflect your stock picking skills or investment analysis skills and will outperform the market. And active strategy means a number of things or has a number of investment implications. Uh, the first element that you have to that you have to always keep in mind about active strategies. In other words, these are let's call them disadvantages. The advantage is the potential of outperforming the market for a given risk, for the same risk. So costly research. In other words, if you're going to be picking stocks, you will incur costs associated with research. Well, again, what is research? Research is the investment analysis that you must perform in order to pick stocks. As simple as that. So, 
It's costly. It takes an awful lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And it takes a lot of skills. It takes a lot of experience. And if you're going to be using someone else's time and effort, it is costly. Number one. Number two. Costly training. Yes, you do have you do have professionals which use active strategy, which will just cherry pick the dirty stocks and hold them for the long run. Such an investor is Warren Buffett. He is cherry picking very few of them. Once he buys them, he holds them for decades. But most active investors will usually be trading a lot. They will see that as fundamentals of some stocks change, they'll buy more of them or will sell or liquidate. In other words, uh, active portfolio management requires active rebalancing. And rebalancing meaning buying and selling your stocks so as to reduce or increase the weight of a particular stock and this requires trading and trading is costly you make your broker rich next one is management fees now management fees managers investment managers are of course expensive very expensive so usually takes a fairly good percentage of money, uh, between 1 and 2% of your total, the value of your total portfolio that you pay to managers to manage actively your portfolio, alright? So, these guys worth, are worth money. And finally, there is that one last argument against active investing is so-called free riders. These are guys who don't want to pay for the research, who won't do most of the costly trading and fees. They will try to mimic your active portfolio in a fairly cheap manner. Well, how could they mimic? How could they know what's the contents of your portfolio? They have to know who buys stocks. No, those. Funds usually must disclose yeah. at the end of every quarter. That's they right. are regulated. They must file with the SEC or whatever regulatory authority. So someone can simply see what is the investment, what's the contents of the portfolio, and mimic it cheaply. All right. Let's see. We got plenty of time, and we're moving on to the next chapter, which is. Uh, six and we are moving now at the heart of portfolio theory Macroeconomic. 
factors. Again, uh, the textbook says so, we can always put before that, you have global factors. Of course, you always want to start with, start with global. Then, once you evaluate the overall global macroeconomic environment, you have a macro environment. Then, you have industry. Industry. So, based on the analysis of macro of the macro economy, what you do is called macro investment analysis. Macro investment analysis. So now we're moving into fundamental analysis. Usually, fundamental analysis begins with analyzing the global macroeconomic environment. Then you analyze the overall macro environment. What would this mean in the real world? It simply means that, oh, right now, uh, November 8th, 2008, the US economy is slipping into a recession. So suddenly, you see the US economy is rapidly decelerating or falling into a tailspin, and you must be very careful in how you value stocks. In other words, hey, the economy may get out of the recession in three months, or it may take two years before the economy gets out of the recession. So, how you forecast the recession is crucial for your investments. Why? Well, overall statistics, statistical analysis usually say that stock markets begin to forecast the bottom of a recession roughly six, nine months in advance. If you think that the economy will bottom in three or six months, now will soon, you'd better be buying stocks now, as now the stock market is probably bottoming. But if you think that the recession will last for another two years, then it will be a total disaster to buy stocks today, as they will be going down for another year, year and a half, all right? And then, of course, this is gonna mean, mean major losses, because when the market falls, it usually falls a lot faster on the way down than it goes on the way up. The next one is industry, so of course it depends on the industry. For example, all car makers in the United States, and we specify American car makers in the United States are indeed trouble. You don't want to invest in the car industry these days. I mean, they're almost bankrupt. Well, they say government, give us 30, 40 billion, otherwise we are bankrupt, all right? I mean, they are bankrupt, so the question is, how much the government will give them for free? In other words, how much subsidy? What's going to be the size of the subsidy? And therefore, how much the subsidy will help the stock market? Extremely risky proposition. What may happen, the government say, oh yeah, we will definitely, we will definitely give you 50 billion, but first, we declare you bankrupt, we wipe out the stock, meaning stock turns out zero, and then the government becomes the owner of the new stock. Gives the 50, billion and then the government sells the stock and try to make at least some money out of it. In other words, they say, oh, you investors invested in GM which is bankrupt, well, you'll get zero for that, all right? This could happen. With industry, you get sometimes it's called sectoral, sectoral investment analysis. So, do you want to invest in the pharmaceutical sector or the automotive sector or, I don't know, the tech sector, etc. And finally, you have the company. Finally, you have the company. The idea is, yes, you have particular risk to particular companies, but if you take sufficiently many companies, you're going to be able to diversify the risk within a particular company. If you have a particular risk within a given industry, for example, if the automotive industry may experience some risks, or the banking industry may experience some risks, you can take or diversify across 10 different uh, industries, and if one or two industries underperform, maybe one, two, or three.
you will outperform. So most of the so-called market risk, and I'm getting to it now, market risk is simply the risk associated with the whole stock market, is usually driven by macro and global factors, yes, economy, factors. So the macro and global economy is market risk, or most of the returns of the stock markets in the midterm. Of course, day to day, they're little determined, but maybe week to week, and especially quarter to quarter, three months to three months, or a year to year, macroeconomics and global economy determine the most of market returns and therefore most of market risk, all right? So that is why you have a lot of funds who are called global macro funds. Global macro fund is the idea of, oh, well, Vietnam will certainly outperform, will certainly outperform uh, markets. Or the idea might be, hey, it could be that GCC countries during the global financial storm, GCC countries will outperform other markets. Now, what you have to understand is that it is not necessary that GCC markets actually go up. All that is necessary is that you correctly call the GCC countries will be affected less by the global financial storm. If this is the case, what you do is you take a long position in GCC. Of course, there will be some ETF to mimic GCC markets. And you short other markets. You short Asian markets, you short uh, Western European markets. And even if GCC markets go down by 10%, but the other markets that you shorted go down by 20%, you're still going to come out all right with even a profit because you'd be making 20% on your shorts and you're going to be losing 10% on your longs. On the net, you'd be making 10%. And in this really terrible environment where all stock markets go down, making 10% is an extraordinary accomplishment, all right? So, this is what global macro is about, and this is what market risk is about, and the idea behind portfolio theory is that the macro economy will do whatever it will do, and you cannot diversify market risk. It is non-diversifiable. Diversified. In other words, market risk is a risk which is driven by global and macro indicators. Global could be something like war with Iran. Suddenly, the whole world is shocked, and of course, most markets will collapse. And there is little you can do with diversification about it. In other words, market risk is that risk which still remains no matter how much you diversify. Question? What about uh, natural disasters? Hmm? Natural yes, disasters. natural disaster will be another great example. You get some natural disaster, a typhoon, hurricane, or whatnot, and suddenly it wipes out a whole lot more of the economy. Of course, one of the biggest market risks which we saw actually materialize was on September 11. You had a terrorist attack and stock markets in the United States but also around the world just totally and completely collapsed. And again, it is the same old story. No matter how perfectly you are diversified, if the whole market collapses or all markets around the world collapse, you can't do much or anything with diversification. So, yes, we just call it non-diversifiable. And another name is, this is a risk which pertains to the system, not to the 
the particular stock, so we call this systematic. In other words, market risk is the same as non diversifiable and it is exactly the same as systematic. And we have a few more names, right? Yeah, these are the key names. Alright, so these are the this is the risk which still remains no matter how well diversified you are. Alright, so how do we call a risk which is particular to a given company? Unsystematic. Unique. Unique. Uh, <laughs> Alright, so. Alright, so let's try and give all the names. They mean the same thing. So first and foremost is unique risk. This is the risk which is unique to the company. And we just call it unique. Well, no matter what the risk is for one particular company, it is diversified. So, oftentimes it is called diversifiable. Now we got some more of these. Another one is called firm specific. Firm specific. In other words, this is risk specific to that particular firm. Remember, company is the same as firm. Yeah, we can just call it non-systematic. This is why here, systematic. So, we got more names. Now let's see that we're running, or you guys are running out. I'm not yet running out. I got one more. This is a very weird word in English, but sounds scientific. Idiosyncratic. Idiosyncratic. Idiosyncrasy is something which is particular or characteristic of one particular individual. So this is idiosyncratic means characterizing a specific individual. Alright? Well, the individual in this case is company. So, in finance, if you really want to be fancy and scientific, you say idiosyncratic risk, and suddenly you're a whole lot smarter than the others because the others have no idea what you're talking about or can't figure out. They're actually talking about unique or diversifiable or company risk. Sometimes they just call it company risk. Company or company specific risk. All right. So these are all names for risk which could be sufficiently eliminated with. And here's the key word: proper diversification. In other words, some diversifications are proper, some are not proper, and uh, proper is difficult, very difficult to define. Uh, so what we use instead of finance is efficient, efficient diversification. Let's, let's see when I'm going to come up with uh, this. So these are all types of risk. Now I market and whatnot. And finally, there is one other type of risk. And this is called portfolio risk. And this is simply the risk which your own portfolio, which you constructed, is subject to. All right? So, every portfolio has its risk. And its risk is some sort of weighted average of the risk of its components in combination with the interrelationships, which we call covariances of its portfolio, uh, of its components. All right, so what do we do now? Six, two. Let's see, six, two. Six, two simply says diversification or asset allocation between two 
risky assets. Let's see what we got at this uh, uh, point. Well, this is fairly straightforward. If you have only one investment, you're subject to the risk of that one investment. If you get a second investment, your overall risk goes down. The key to how much it goes down is associated with the concept of covariance. And out of covariance is defined alternatively correlation. Correlation. Let's say correlation is positive, correlation is positive, when a positive return in one asset results in, and here's the key word, expected positive return of the other asset. So a positive return in the one results in an expected positive return of the other. Respectively, a negative return of the one results in an expected negative return of the other. So, instead of positive correlation is uh, neutral, we rarely use neutral. We we'll call them uncorrelated. Uncorrelated simply means that no matter what the return of the one asset is, it does not affects or relate to the return of the other asset. Neutral kind of was uncorrelated and finally you have negative. A negative correlation simply means that a positive, positive return of one asset results in an expected negative return of the other asset. And opposite, if you get a negative return in one asset, it results in an expected positive return of the other asset. Alright, so correlation turns out to be the major determinant of diversification. So, diversification, diversification, first of all, turns out to work very well, is very good when correlation is negative. Good when correlation is negative. Alright, let's say this. Let's say diversification is excellent. Excellent when correlation is negative. In other words, actually I should do the opposite error. That's my mistake. Negative correlation results in excellent diversification. The next case is neutral or uncorrelated. Uncorrelated assets result actually in fairly good, very good. Diversification. And finally, strong positive, strong positive correlation results in very, very poor diversification. This simply means one goes up 5%, the other one goes up 5%. One goes up 1%, the other one goes up 1%. One goes down 7%, the other one... They move as if they are one. In other words, by adding a second asset, which correlates almost perfectly, this is the same as floating together, you aren't getting much benefit out of diversification. So diversification works very poorly when you have positive assets. So what we find is that usually commodities, of course not always, usually commodities are negatively 
correlated to stock markets. This actually, most of the times, you'll find fairly decent negative correlation. It simply means that investing in commodities is an excellent, is an excellent diversifier and should be a major component of major doesn't mean doesn't mean a huge percentage. It just means should be present. Well, guess what? Turns out, well, it's not on the board that gold is nicely uh, correlated in a very negative manner with the market. Usually, when markets go up, gold is underperforming. When markets underperform, usually gold is outperforming. So, gold turns out to have a fairly decent negative correlation, and this is one outstanding, or one really good reason to have some some gold in your portfolio. Again, you got to understand, I've been saying now two different things today. The one thing that I said is gold is really good in highly inflationary times. This is actually based on fundamental analysis. You expect it to outperform the stock market. So, you will add extra weight to gold on your portfolio based on this analysis. This is on top of any gold that you'll put in your portfolio just as a diversifier. In other words, let me try to give an example. If you're going to be just diversifying your portfolio, you will put 10% gold into it. But if you actually believe that stock market will, will uh, possibly underperform or you believe that there will be fairly high inflation, you may want actually for inflationary times, you know for sure that bonds will underperform, to cut down the relative weighting of bonds and increase the relative weight of gold. So you will, we call it overweight gold and underweight bonds. Again, overweighting and underweighting is driven by some other macro and expectations. Macro, possibly for poor economy, possibly for high inflationary times ahead. And these are not dependent on this. In other words, this is just a diversifier. It belongs there as a diversifier. Of course, rather than diversifying with gold, you're now subject to some gold risk. How can you diversify the risk of gold? Well, one way to diversify is adding a little bit of silver, adding a little bit of platinum. Well, you might diversify gold because gold represents overall inflation and is a proxy for all the other commodities. So, what you may want to throw in is some extra energy, like crude oil, extra agricultural commodity, like wheat and rice, and rather than keep 10% of gold in your portfolio, you might be better off throwing in 2% gold, 2% oil, 2% wheat, 2% I don't know, some other commodity, zinc, 2% of something else. In other words, you diversify across the commodity spectrum. You guys getting bored, right? Uh, let's see, last question and we're finished for today. The US dollar and oil prices. Okay. They have a negative correlation to it. Yes, they have negative correlation for different reasons. It's a big topic. Uh, I have it recorded on video. You can watch it on video for my management course. Alright, we're done.